Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to Thursday Night in the Word, and so glad you're here with us. Uh, my name is Jerry Westerfield, and I'm the pastor at Bethesda, and uh, just really glad to have you with us. I hope that you that have been tuning in, that the Word of God is speaking to your heart, and you're feeling a little challenged, and, uh, because I believe God wants all of us to press in, and God wants all of us to move forward. And we need to realize that even though we're living in trying, testing times, um, God is with us. God is for us. Um, no weapon formed against us um, shall prosper. You know, I heard someone say this week, you may have your weapon formed, but it's not going to prosper. And that, I believe that. I believe the enemy's got all of his tactics and he's got his warfare and he's got his weapons that he uses against us. But our God is greater. The God that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. And even though the enemy tries to make it seem like that he's got a chance to win, he knows he's been defeated. He knows he's been put down. But yet he's going to attack. He's going to come against us because he knows um, there's just a short time, but he also wants to um, have each one of us in his hand, uh, people serving him, because he wants the same results for them as he does and knows that he has for himself. But you and I are a people of faith. We're not like other Gentiles who are asleep or slumbering. Or, um, we're of faith and we have been enlightened. And even though we may stumble and fall, even though we may fail, um, we know in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and King. And in our heart that he is for us and not against us. And so even when we fall, we get back up, we brush ourselves off, we cry out to God, and he tells us in his word that he will not cast us away. And so our faith will hold. He prayed for Peter. He said, Peter, I'm praying for you that your faith will not fail. And so what we're after is we're after that our faith would become strong, that we'd be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And I believe today if there's ever been a time when we really need to dig in and go deep in our faith and see our faith strengthen, it's the time we live in. When we look around the world, we see chaos. When we look at this life, we see pestilence, earthquakes, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation, people against people. Um, we can even see the scripture that tells us that father against son and son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, Brothers against brothers, sisters against sisters. Uh, we're living in a time right now where people want us to be divided and be um, overcome. And so we're in a battle with white against black or black against white or Hispanics or Asian Americans or whatever um, your nationality might be. It's people wanting to pit us against one another when um, God tells us that we are all his children in his sight. There is no difference in us. We are all the human race. We all bleed uh, red blood. And we are all a part of the same human race. The only difference in us is some have dedicated their lives to Christ and have become a child of God. And some have not yet seen the light and they serve, even though it may be unwittingly. They serve the enemy. And so our responsibility is, is to love others just like we love God. To love God, love others. Love God, love our neighbors. And to um, love people right where they're at, not uh, because of the color of their skin, not because of their stature in life, but to love people no matter what and no matter where they are. And, and I believe that that's going to come because we mature and grow up and become what God wants us to be. We should be desiring to move forward and become stronger in the Lord and the power of his might. We should be desiring to be more dedicated than ever before and to God's word, knowing the truth, because the truth, knowing Jesus Christ sets us free. Knowing the truths of Jesus Christ and his word keeps us on the right path. It keeps our minds focused. Amen. It keeps our hearts focused on um, the righteousness of God. And so, you know, we are talking about faith. This is um, the last few lessons that we'll have on faith. And then we're going to begin to talk about another doctrine called the doctrine of baptisms. These are all 
considered the milk of God's word. Um, that that we need to have a good solid foundation. If you want to be able to be established in the kingdom of God, you have to have a good solid foundation. That foundation in Jesus Christ will keep you for all of your days. And if you don't have a good foundation, though, you're going to be just like a natural building. You're going to begin to have problems and issues and things that will need to be repaired or if not repaired or not maintained, you'll find yourself crumbling under the pressure. When you're in the wine press, you'll find yourself giving way. When you're under pressure, you'll find yourself with your faith weak. And so it's important that right now we develop this faith. We um, eat right, digest the right food. We listen to the voice of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of the Lord, that we make sure we're doing the things that's necessary to um, strengthen our faith. The enemy's working against us. We know that. We know that the battle is out there, but the Bible says the battle is not ours. The battle is the Lord's. God has won the war and he is strengthening us for the battle. It's not just like he won the war, then he's leaving us to the skirmishes by ourselves. The Bible says that his spirit is with us, that God walks with us. He communicates with us. He fellowships with us. He's given us the power of his word. He says he gave us the keys to the kingdom of God. He gave us all the weapons that we need to fight this fight. But he says to us, the weapons of your warfare, they're not carnal, but they're mighty through God. They're spiritual weapons. And they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What are those weapons? It's the sword of the spirit, the word of God. It's the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the feet that are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt uh, of truth. And, and we know that when we have all this stuff on that God has supplied for us, we are more than conquerors. The enemy would like for us to believe that we're defeated. The enemy would like for us to believe that, man, we're on our last leg. The enemy would, would like for us to believe the church is going under. The church is, there's no need um, for us gathering today. Everybody must be on their own, but his whole desire is to divide and conquer. But our faith will keep us strong. You know, when I said earlier that um, we're living in a time when um, mother against father and sister against brother and children against their parents and all that kind of stuff. But it's also, you know, not just color against color or race against race because we're the human race, but it's also he's trying to work it now where it's church against church, Christian against Christian. Isn't that sad? Because the church is supposed to be unified. The Bible teaches us how will men know that we are his disciples? And that is the love that we have one to another. It's not a competition. It's not to see who's bigger, better. It's not to see who has more toys or who can do more things. It's about us pulling together in the same direction, letting our faith arise together, unify. One can put a thousand to flight, but two can put 10,000 to flight. That message of synergism is powerful today. What we can do together, man, what if the church would ever unify? What if we would ever pull together instead of fussing and fighting over insignificant issues or what if, letting, allowing uh, just um, our own ideas or opinions separate us? What if we put all that stuff aside and it's not my preferences, not your preferences, but we just base our lives upon the love of God and the love for each other? Wouldn't we be able to accomplish great things for the Lord? And so we're talking about faith, and that faith has to remain toward God. If, if we don't direct our faith toward God, we're defeated already because it's when we look to God, the mountain shrinks. It's when we look to God, the trials don't seem near as big. When we look to God, the enemy flees. It's when we get our eyes off of him and we're faith, our faith sometimes that's directed by even even people who preach the word, our faith is directed at things, our people, our circumstances. We're defeated. We're defeated already. But when our faith is directed toward God, when our faith is directed toward him, we are more than conquerors. And we can sing that song, we shall not be defeated. 
we shall overcome if we have our faith in God. And so we've been talking about this faith toward God. And, and last week we talked about faith and unbelief. We talked about relationship of tribulation and, and faith. And this week we're going to talk about the relationship of time and faith. Um, because we know that um, the hardest thing for us is the time frame between us praying and asking and talking to God about um, what, what's needed and when the manifestation comes. It's in that period of time, no matter how short it is, that the enemy throws his fiery darts. You know, we have the shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the enemy, the wicked, the enemy. But when he throws those darts at us, it's, it's, it's in that time right there that the enemy wants us to waver. You know, because James says this, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. We, we, can't, we can't be double-minded or we can't walk in unbelief or anxiety or fear or not trust the Lord. It's important for us that we, re we realize this relationship of time and faith. Um, we talked about a lot about endurance. We have to endure. Um, and, and, you know, endurance and all that's not talked about much today. Long suffering, endurance, trials, tests. I mean, we all want to preach the good, warm, fuzzy things. But the truth of the matter is, is we have to learn how to endure, the Bible says, hardships. We endure difficulties. When we look at the New Testament church, the disciples had to endure many, many hardships. They weren't loved. They weren't popular. They weren't um, Hollywood-type individuals. They were everyday individuals walking by faith, preaching the gospel, and people hated them. And Jesus even warned them. He even warned them. Because they hated me, they're going to hate you. Religious people hated them. Governments hated them. Citizens Hated their own countrymen hated them, but yet they served God and 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 looked to Him and tried to keep their eyes focused on the Lord. And even when they did that, at times they suffered. And so we have to have endurance. But even endurance, by its own definition, involves time. When you talk about enduring something, I have to endure this. Let's say aggravation. Or I have to endure this situation at work. I have to endure this uh, circumstance or I have to endure this person that doesn't exactly um, get along with me. I have to endure that. And when we talk about that, um, we know that there is a time frame that we're speaking about. I have to endure this headache. I endure light afflictions, all those things. And so we know it involves time. And so and, and thinking about that, though, we also talked about in Mark eleven twenty four, very important scripture, that if we believe we receive what we desire when we pray, we shall see it manifest later. Mark eleven twenty four says, therefore, I tell you, whatsoever you ask when you pray, believe that you have received it, and you shall have it. So the question comes in, when am I supposed to believe? And because we're in the shape that we're in, a lot of times our believing is really not faith, it's hope. You know, we're hoping that God will show up. We're hoping that God will answer our prayer. But faith is believing that when we pray and the witness in our heart is that God answered, then we believe right then and there for what it is that we're praying about. For example, you're praying for a... a, a one of your children that's gone astray or that's not serving God. You pray for them and you feel in your heart God's going to give you your family. Well, when do you believe that? When it manifests and they're all coming to church with you? No, you have to believe that when you pray and that witness of the Holy Spirit is in your heart. You believe and so therefore you speak. God, I thank you for saving my son. I thank you, God, for saving my boys. I thank you, God, for saving my daughter. I thank you, God, that they are going to be worshipers of you. 
I thank you, Lord God, that you have called them out of darkness into your marvelous light. God, I thank you that they are worshipers. You begin to confess with your mouth what you have prayed and believed for. You begin to see them with their hands raised high. You begin to see them serving God with all their hearts. You begin to see their family in church. You begin to see them doing things for God and working for Him. Way before there's ever any manifestation. You believe it. Why? Because you ask and you have a witness in your heart. That's what God's Word says. And then what do I do in the meantime, this time? Because what happens in that time factor is... The enemy will try to cause you to doubt. Your, your kids will be doing something they shouldn't do, or you'll hear something from them, or they'll talk about something, or you'll be encouraging them to go to church, and they'll say, I don't want to go to church. I don't know if I believe in all that or not. And so the enemy in this time factor is going to do everything he can in this period of time right here through tribulating you and causing you issues to get you to waver in your faith. But God gives us his promises. God gives us his promises. He tells us that if you train up a child in the way that it goes, it, and when it gets old, it won't depart from it. We know salvation is an individual thing, but man, if you've sowed good seed in your kids, I'm telling you, we have to believe for that seed to come to fruition. We have to believe for their lives to be affected by that and them to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and seek after his face. We have to believe that. we, st God, I'm standing on your promises that it's not just for me, but it's for me and my house, my children and my children's children. That's what we stand on. And we hold on to that invisible evidence until the manifestation takes place. But I'm going to tell you what faith is believing way before the manifestation. It is in that time, though. It is in that time because time definitely plays a part in our walk of faith. It is in that time factor that the enemy will attack you. Don't forget that. He's coming after you. He wants you to waver. He wants you to doubt. He wants you to be in unbelief. He wants you to walk in anxiety. Oh, God, I believed in this. For so many years, surely it's, you, you must have forgot it's not going to happen. That's what the enemy wants you to do. It's just like preaching about end times and the coming of the Lord. The enemy puts it in people's minds and hearts so that they discourage people. Well, I've heard that all my life. It's never happened. They already have a seed of doubt about the Lord's coming. But listen, the scripture teaches us, man, don't be slothful about what you've heard because the Lord's going to come as a thief in the night. He's not going to be a thief to those that are ready and waiting for him. He's going to be a thief to those that are asleep and those that are unsaved. Because he's going to come and they're not going to recognize him. But that doesn't change the word of God, does it? It doesn't change God's word that that's what's going to take place. It doesn't change God's word that he said it's for me and my children and my, chil and my children's children. That's the truth of God's word. And so in my mind, my spiritual mind, because you got to remember, we talked about the natural and the spiritual. And the Bible says there's a natural mind and there's a spiritual mind. The natural mind, he says, is carnal. And that natural mind is enmity against God. But the spiritual mind is sowed in the seed of God. And that spiritual mind sees things differently than the natural mind. And so with my spiritual mind, even though the natural doesn't give evidence to it, in my spiritual mind, I'm going to believe what God says, not what the enemy says. I'm going to believe what God says, not sometimes what my natural eye sees. Why? Because we walk by faith, not by sight. This time factor between faith's answer and the manifestation, even if it is a fraction of a second, there's this space of time. This time period where faith is tested is controlled by God alone. Satan launches his all-out attack to get the believer to waver and prevent him from holding on to God's, what God's put in us for our profession of faith. Now, I'm not talking about some whacked out, just speaking some random thing out here. I'm talking about a profession of faith that's based off the scripture. And I study the scripture, I look at the scripture, and I say, I believe that. I believe, therefore I speak it. 
Even though I've had many battles and struggles, I'm going to tell you what, I'm believing for my life victory. Why? Because God tells me I'm, I'm a victor. I'm victorious. Even though it seems like sometimes that if I looked at the natural, I'm weak, I'm going to fail, the enemy's going to overcome. God says, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I'm taking God at his word and I'm, I'm believing. But I'm not just believing in my heart. I'm speaking with my mouth a word of faith, the word of testimony. And what do I have as a Christian to help support that? The same thing that David had when he and his men came back to Ziglag and found out that their families had been captured. The Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. How did he encourage himself? He started telling himself about the victories that he had won. Listen, when the enemy comes in like a flood, I raise up a standard against him. And what is that standard? It's the word of God. It's the truth. But also, I tell him about the victories that God's done in my life. When the enemy tells me I'm defeated, I talk about how when I was lost and undone, God gave me the victory and changed my life. When I fail, I tell the enemy, hey, wait a minute. God says, when I have failed, confess my sin before him. He's faithful and just to forgive me of my sins. My name's been written in the Lamb's book of life. No man can pluck me out of the hand of God. And so we have to know that it's in that time period when we're going through this um, believing something and manifesting the truth, when that's manifested, there's that time factor that the enemy is testing us. He is, he is sending his fiery darts to see how we are going to walk and how we are going to react. Satan really launches his all-out attack to get the believer to waver, prevent him from holding fast to that profession of faith. To believe God, um, James 1, 6 and 7 says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must suppose that he will receive, will not receive anything from the Lord. When we doubt and waver, we need to know. We understand, don't we? That we will not receive anything from the Lord. We have to hold fast our profession of faith. Hebrews uh, 10, 23 says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. God is faithful. God doesn't fail. He doesn't let us down. A lot of times where we waver at is we base, we base our relationship with God off of our relationships in the natural. Moms failed us, dads failed us, brothers and sisters failed us, kids have failed us, works failed us. All types of situations. Friends have failed us, people who have said, man, I got your back. They run off and desert you. And we look at our relationship with God the same way. But, this, but the scripture says to us, he who promised is faithful. No matter what that time frame is, we can believe what God says. Whatever God says, we can believe it to be true. That's what the word teaches us. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much time passes or how, how, how fast or how many times the earth spins on its axis. It doesn't make any difference between how long it takes between the prayer and the manifestation in the natural realm. It doesn't have anything to do with the faithfulness of God. God is faithful. God is faithful. When God answers you as you pray in faith, it is as good as done unless the devil can get you to stop believing what you have received in prayer. And you know what I'm talking about, surely, if you're a believer and you've been a believer for very long. You know what I'm talking about when you're, in, when you're in prayer with God and you're communing with the Lord and you're needing an answer, you're praying about something. You know what I'm talking about when the Holy Spirit witnesses that God has settled it. Man, when God settled it, I believe it and it's so. If God says it, I believe it and it's so. When you know that you know God has answered my prayer, you say, well, but I don't see it. Well, if you have to see it, it's not faith. Remember, faith comes by 
hearing, hearing by the word of the Lord. We hear from God through his word and through the witness of the spirit. But it also says we walk by faith, not by sight, right? So I don't have to see it. I have to believe it. People say, oh, that's just charismatic mumbo jumbo or that's just Pentecostal craziness. No, man, that's the word of God. That's what God's word teaches us. Not to hope that it happens, but to believe. Man, I don't hope I'm saved. Man, I believe I'm saved. And I'm going to confess the things of God because of it. Amen? In our natural walk, we exercise our faith even though there is a time delay. For example, pushing an elevator button and waiting. We, we push an elevator button. I push floor three. I'm believing. That's, that's natural faith. I'm believing. Man, I'm going to get, when that door opens, I'm going to get the door to floor three. We, we do that all the time. There's all kinds of different things that we do, that we have natural faith for, that we have to wait on. I, I don't push three and automatically be on three. I push three. There's a time factor between getting there. You turn on a fluorescent light. A lot of times I flip the switch since we started using fluorescents or different types of light bulbs. I turn on a switch and I thought to myself, in the moment that it takes for that thing to come on, is that light burn out? And then boom, there it is. People get penicillin shot. People get antibiotics and they're believing because the doctor said, this is what's going to help you. They're believing that's going to help. But I'm going to tell you what, there's nobody gets a penicillin shot where as soon as that shot goes in, they feel great. As soon as that antibiotic, that first dose, you take that first dose, it doesn't mean that you're feeling great. You might still run a fever for a day or two. You might still have issues for a day or two until that gets in your system and kicks in. There's a time factor in all those things. Well, if we're going to trust all these things, if we're going to trust the natural things, should we not, at, at knowing that in the natural things, there's time factors that's involved, should we not trust God more? Sure we should. Not just as much. I think that's the question we might ask. Shouldn't we trust God as much? No, really, we should trust God more. Because God's greater than all the, these natural things. Satan cannot steal or destroy the spiritual possessions that we lay hold of by faith because they are in heavenly places. Colossians 1.13 said, He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Did you hear that? He's not talking to people about once we get into heaven, leave this earth. He's talking about right now. He has delivered us right now. If you're, if you're a believer and you're, you're serving Jesus Christ and you've been made new, he has transformed you from the kingdom of darkness into his glorious, marvelous kingdom. That's awesome, man. Think about that. Right now, we can behold his beauty. We can behold his glory. Why? Because the kingdom of God is within us. The kingdom of God is within us. And what makes the kingdom of God visible is you and I when we walk in faith. Everywhere we go, the kingdom of God is present. We are what makes the kingdom of God visible. The church, the pillar, and the ground of the truth. Satan can't steal these spiritual possessions. I, I, I praise God for that. Ephesians 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. You and I sit in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. We right now are walking and living in his kingdom. When they ask Jesus, Jesus, teach us to pray. Jesus told them, pray this, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When should that kingdom come? Right now. We should be starting to subject this world to the kingdom of God. Everywhere we go, the love, the joy, the peace, the gentleness, the kindness, the long suffering, patience, all these things should be operating in us and everywhere we go, we should be taking all of this with us, even in the midst of the turmoil. And I'm preaching to myself today. We're, I don't know of anybody that's arrived or that's there. 
We're all a work in progress, but this is what we want to get to. And as our faith develops and as our faith grows and is strengthened and, and becomes stronger, that we, that we are not weak and that we allow God's spirit to direct us instead of listening to the flesh. I want you to know this is what God has for us right now here on this earth. This is not something that we look forward to one day in a glorious world, uh, to be with our glorious heaven, to be with Jesus. Man, this can be our reality right now, walking by faith in the kingdom of God. Hebrews 6, 12 says, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherited the promise. Inherited the promise. Don't be slug sluggish. Don't be slackers, but be imitators, imitators of Paul, imitators of Peter, imitators of G James, imitators of Abraham, imitators of the patriarchs, imitators of those who have gone before us, lifting up our hands in the most holy faith, believing that what God did with them, he can do it also in us. But now listen, let's don't fool ourselves. That's not all going to come easy. Satan, just because we have given our hearts and lives to God, Satan's not over the corner crying somewhere and giving up. He's fighting us. Scripture teaches us we don't fight against flesh and blood, but spiritual wickedness in high places. The Bible teaches us the devil, like a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The Bible teaches us, John 10.10 10 tells us, Thief comes not, but to kill, to steal, and destroy. That's, that's what the enemy's trying to do. He's trying to rob us. He's trying to get the church to fall, to be asleep. He's trying to get the church to stay in a coma. He's trying to convince you and I that we can just go along in this sluggish, um, mediocre, mediocrity life, this religious life. We, we, he's trying to convince us that as long as we're doing the things that we've always done, we're going to be all right. But I want you to know, that's a lie. Because Jesus tells us, the thief may come to steal, to kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life. But listen, not just life, not just going through the motions. He's called us that we might have life and have it more abundantly. That's, that's powerful, isn't it? He doesn't want us just to have life. He doesn't want us just to bear fruit. He wants us to bear abundant fruit. He doesn't want us just to have life. He wants us to have abundant life. Wow. Aren't we living below our privileges? I feel like I am a lot of times. And I'm sure that you probably feel the same way. We live below our privileges. But we need to understand something, and that is Satan is going to attack. Uh, 2 Peter 2, 7-9 says, And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as, it, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormented, tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. Now Lot had a problem and issue. Lot was with Abraham. Abraham's relative. Lot could have been right there with Abraham, but Lot saw a city. Lot, Lot wanted to take his family down around Sodom and Gomorrah, and so the Bible says he went there. Well, Lot fell in with all those that were there, even though Lot may have not went as far as they did. The Bible says Lot was vexed, you know, with a filthy conversation. Lot had some of that stuff rub off on him that was going on there in the city. But yet Lot still believed God. But even when they were leaving the city, as the angels of the Lord brought them out, the Bible says that it was such a draw and an attraction to that city. Lot's son-in-law stayed there. And there was such a draw and an attraction to that city that on the way out, his wife looked back. And she was turned to a pillar of salt. Satan doesn't stop because we have a victory. Satan doesn't quit because we have victory. No, he is going to come at us with everything that he's got. And I want to tell you what, if you just focus on, on, on the two um, avenues that Satan uses to attack us, you can become victorious. There are definitely two of the most common avenues that Satan attacks us, 
is through circumstances and people. Think about it. Circumstances and people. He will use your circumstances to cause you to fear and doubt and unbelief. He will use people to discourage you from believing in the Lord and his promises. If you would sit for a moment, just like in this pandemic that we've had, if you would just sit for a moment and think about social distancing when you go out, people aren't social distancing. We can see it. They're not doing that. We're, we're touching the same things they touch. We're passing by them close and, and, and gone in the same bathrooms. I mean, you know, one of the things in Kentucky, one of the restrictions on churches that we should have somebody at the bathroom. And every time somebody comes out of it, we need to go in and disinfect. <laughs> what store have you been in that does that? But yet, that's what they say. You, you know, Satan uses all those kind of things to try to, to, to distract us. Circumstances. People will come along and you're trying to believe God. God is my healer. God is my redeemer. God is my protector. The Lord has a hedge built around me. He covers me with under the shadow of his wings. God lifts me up uh, upon a rock and I am established and stable. You're believing that. You're confessing that. And then here comes along everybody else. Oh, man, you got watch out. Don't touch that. You'll die. Watch out. You might get the thing. Watch out. You'll bring that to your kids. Watch out. You'll do this. And, he, and, and people try to cause us to have unbelief. I'm not saying for you to be stupid and, and, and ignorant. But listen, folks, we can't be alarmed at every little thing that somebody throws into our face. God's bigger than all if we but believe. But Satan comes through circumstances and people. And sometimes they're well-intentioned people. But who should, whose report should I believe? Who should I be listening to? Man, we discard our spiritual leaders all the time to listen to who? The government. We, we, we toss our spiritual leaders aside. Why? To listen to even doctors and physicians. And I'm not saying that they're all bad. I'm not saying that at all. But doctors and physicians will tell you, man, that it's not an exact science. They're practicing medicine. That's why sometimes you go in for some type of something that's going wrong with you, and you'll get two and three um, different prescriptions in two or three weeks because one didn't work. They don't know exactly because it's not an exact science. But there is one that knows his name is Jesus. And I'm not telling somebody not to go out, not to let nobody treat you. But, man, we shouldn't put more faith in all that than we do God. But this tribulation and stuff that we go through, these trials that we go through, they are the times when the enemy throws at us everything he can. Both the Bible and life's experiences provide us with ample examples of how circumstances and people can really tempt us to take our eyes off of the truths of the spiritual realm and fix them on natural things. Take time to think of some biblical examples and past personal experiences that you yourself have gone through or that you have read about that they've gone through where they had some time frame there in which they were waiting on the victory. Daniel and the lion's den, three Hebrew children. There was a time frame there in which they weren't delivered. God could have delivered three Hebrew children before the fight. But he didn't. He decided and determined it was, it was more important to deliver them in the fire, not before it. Daniel could have been delivered before he went in the lion's den, but God wanted to prove himself strong while Daniel was in the lion's den. And 21 days later, God showed up in the way that Daniel needed. But yet we know that in that period of time, God sent the answer before the angel ever arrived. When we consider 2 Peter um, 2, um, seven through nine that, that I read a little bit ago. When, when we look at that and we consider that passage of scripture, you realize how important it is to police what you see and hear. Lot was vexed, especially when your faith is being tried. When you're being tested and you're going through trials, you know, the Bible says that God knows how to make a way of escape for us. But man, you got to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit when you're in the midst of those trials that you can hear what the Spirit is saying. As we reflect on that passage, it gives new meaning and appreciation for the Scripture passage 
found in 2 Corinthians 13 through 18. It says this, not like Moses who would put a veil over his face and so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains um, unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Man, God has lifted the veil from us so that we can see the truth. Amen? So that we can see what God is speaking to us. I want to, I want to finish up today with this. Um, body language and faith, you know, um, we need to understand um, this, that um, only God is omniscient. Only God knows everything. Satan can't read your mind. Satan, Satan can't read your mind. He can send a thought there. And I used to always hear, you know, you can't stop the bird from flying over your head, but you sure can stop it from building a nest in your hair. And I believe that. Satan will throw thoughts, dreams, different things your way. But God says we don't have to dwell on those things. But Satan cannot read our minds because if he could read our minds, he'd have never done to Job what he did because the Bible says Job was an upright uh, man before God and perfect. If, if Satan could read our minds, he would have never done with Jesus what he did because he would have known Jesus was going to defeat him with the word. But Satan can't read our minds. But I'm going to tell you something. Listen, there's something that's very important that we need to realize is that Satan doesn't have any problem knowing what he needs to know about us because most of the time we blab it. We speak it. We're going through something, man, we speak it. Oh, I really do, I, I, that really bothers me. I have no um, strength over that. Or we're, we're telling him what it is before um, he even um, is concerned about it. So he knows what to throw against us. But listen, something else that Satan uses along with that is our body language. When Satan throws a dart, he watches. The demons, they watch on how we react to it. And you know what I'm talking about. You've got news or you've had situations. You've had circumstances in your life. You've had people in your life that, man, their personalities just grate you. And you speak it out or... When they're, when they're around, your body, your body language shows that there is something wrong. And Satan seizes upon those opportunities to launch his attack against us. We have all kinds of things you can look at in the scriptures. But, you know, we can see where if Satan could read our minds, he would have not have done the things that he did when it came to God's servants. He knows a lot of things through observing. Matthew 5, 10 through 12 shows an attitude and action to be embraced during persecution. What is that attitude? That attitude is to look to Jesus, to have hope in him, faith in him. Trust in God. James 1, 1 and 2, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. Don't give place to the devil, Ephesians 4, 27. The Bible teaches us don't give any place to to the devil. Don't react to spiritual warfare, but rather take responsible godly actions. Rejoice in the Lord always. Count it all joy, even when you find yourself in struggles, needing victory. Lift up your eyes to Jesus. Keep your eyes focused on him because he keeps you in peace. Don't give any ground to the enemy. How many of you know, how many of you will confess We've gave up a lot of ground to the enemy. Well, you know what the Bible teaches us? Man, let's take it back. Let's put our faith in Christ. Let's believe God. Let's trust him and believe, even when we don't necessarily see it with the natural eye. Because when I can see it, I no longer need faith. Somebody calls me on the phone, Pastor Jerry. I want to give you $100. Are 
I'll see you Wednesday. And I'm, oh, wow, awesome. I have faith, man. I could, I, I could use that $100. I have faith and believe that that's going to take place, but I don't have it yet, so what good is it yet? But I, I'm going to believe. But when that Wednesday comes and that $100 is in my hand, I no longer need faith for that $100. I said this one time uh, in discipleship class. Um, if you're out and your car breaks down at 4 o'clock in the morning and you call me on the phone and you say, hey, Pastor Jerry, I broke down. Can you come and get me? And you hear me say, yeah, yeah, but I sound really tired. If, if you're struggling to believe, you're going to call somebody else. You're not going to wait until I get there. But when you believe that you believe that you believe, that you know that you know that you know, I called him, he answered, I believe that he'll be here. You can put your phone down, put your seat back, take you a little nap until you hear me knock on that window. That's the way it is with God. We, we trust the Lord because we've got a relationship with him. And when we ask in faith believing according to God's will, we know God is going to see us through. We don't have to be wavering. We can trust. It doesn't matter what darts the enemy throws. Our faith needs to stay strong, not waver. Let's get into the word. Let's let faith arise in us. And let's commit ourselves to the work of the Lord. I hope and pray that you're strengthened by this and that we understand and see that faith, God wants faith to work with us. God wants faith to work with us and in our lives and through us that others can be affected by um, our own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you today. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for each and every person listening to the sound of my voice tonight. Let faith arise in them, God, and their enemies be scattered. Let their lives be consumed with your word and with hearing what the Spirit is speaking to us. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see that we can hear what the Spirit is speaking. We love you so much, Lord. Help us to walk by faith, not by sight. Help us to turn off every conflicting voice and let us focus our attention on the word of faith the word of truth we give you all the praise and all the glory for it and god i pray bless each and every one touch their lives keep them safe and father we give you praise in jesus name god bless you hope you have a great evening